We are talking about freedom. The series began on uh, 4th of July, uh, Independence Day, whatever you want to call it, weekend where we were just going to talk about freedom. In fact, the message John taught last week is he used the notes that both him and I were going to use that day, and it was going to be a one and done, and then we were going to move on to our next series. My problem is I enjoyed what I was going over so much and got to just thinking about it, thinking about my own personal freedom. And because God has set me free from a lot of things. And I thought about how much as your pastor, I desire to see you walk in freedom also. And so I just, you know, started enlarging on what I saw there. And, you know, I was only going to do it for a week or two, and it's turned into, I don't know, so four or five. So we're talking about the freedom that is ours in Christ, and really, more importantly, uh, what it takes to walk in that freedom. You know, our vision for you as a church is that, as, an, as people, is that once you come through these doors and you make Life Church your home, we want you to know God. We want you to find freedom. We want you to discover your purpose so that you can make a difference. And when we say know God, we're not talking about just knowing about him like so many do, having heard about him. We want you to know him in the sense of having a personal relationship with him because that's really where our life begins. And how many know that's where you know, our, we really do find our freedom is in our relationship with him. And so know God, find freedom. We need to find freedom because the fact of the matter is, is even though we are saved and we are on our way to heaven, no doubt about that, if we've received Christ as Lord, we all still have issues in our life. Isn't that right? And if those issues go unaddressed, if those issues are never dealt with, if we don't overcome those things, if we don't conquer those things in our life, they will continue to mess up our new life in Christ. And we won't experience all of the abundant life that we really should. Isn't that right? They'll also hinder us from accomplishing everything that God has called us to do. They just, our issues just mess up our life. Think about how much your issues have messed up your life to this point. And being a Christian doesn't change that. Being a Christian makes you a Christian, sins forgiven on your way to heaven. But you've got to go free from your issues if your life is going to get better and you're going to realize all the good things that God has for you. Amen? So I talked to you about how after I got saved, I still had a whole lot of issues. I struggled with addictions. I had a terrible anger problem. I was very controlling, among other things. And so those issues affected my walk with God, my relationship with God. If nothing else, they made me feel guilty and condemned. And so I was never confident in my relationship with the Lord, which weakened my faith and all of that. But they also affected my relationship with other people, and they undermined my success in life. And these weren't things that I had, you know, just for a year or two. I actually pastored the church for a number of years. I'm the pastor of the church, and I'm struggling with all of these issues, and they're hindering my life in so many ways. So I was saved, but I wasn't free. I was saved, but I was still in bondage, and that's true of all of us. We come to Christ, we're saved, but we all still have issues. I have issues, you have issues. You know how I said, all God's children have issues, and we have uh, things that we struggle with that we're still in bondage to. That really, when we say we're struggling with something, we're in bondage to that thing, whether you realize it or not. So we all have areas where we're not totally free. Jesus came to set us free, and he came to set us totally free. And we established from Luke chapter 4, verses uh, 18, 19, I believe right in there, where that actually is the, the, was the mission of Jesus coming to the earth. We just think it's him forgiving our sins. That It is. It is that. But he said, I've come to set the captives free. I've come to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So I ask you this question. I want to keep asking you the question, what are you still in bondage to? What still has a hold on you in your life that you haven't gone free from? What is it that continues to negatively impact your life, to undermine your success, to mess up your life, as I said? What do you need to be set free from? Maybe it's like me. Maybe it's addictions to alcohol, to drugs, to pornography. That was not my deal, but it was my son's. Obviously, he's talked about that. 
Or perhaps the thing you're in bondage to, because I don't think people always think about these things as being bondage. They just think of them as norm. They're not norm. You shouldn't go through life with fear. You know, how many of you have been around people? You know, it's one thing to be afraid in a moment. It's, a lo- it's another thing to go through life just terrorized by fear, just in bondage to fear. Fear of this, fear of that, right? You ever been around anybody like that? I sure have, you know, and uh, maybe yours is anxiety, depression. I had to overcome that. Insecurity, I actually had to overcome that too, big time. Anger, control, lust. There's all kinds of things, negativity that you can be in bondage to. Jesus came to set the captives free. Whatever you're in bondage to, Jesus came to set you free. Well, man, if he came to set me free, then let's go free. I'd rather live free. Obviously, people want to be free. Battles are fought. Come on. Wars are fought over just the thing of people being free. You try to infringe upon us as a nation and take away our freedom, how many know we will rise to the occasion? How about as the body of Christ, people who have been set free? We got stinking tired, sick and tired of being in bondage to this and bondage to that. And we rose up as the people of God and said, I'm going free. I'm not going to live the rest of my life in bondage to this, in bondage to that. I'm going to live the abundant life because who the Son sets free is totally free. Amen. Amen. So, steps to freedom. Ten of them, real quick. The reason there's ten of them now instead of three and then five and seven. (laughs) Did you notice that? I don't care what people think of me. I don't care. Somebody says, why didn't you have those all together in the first place? Because that's not how this series evolved. So just get over it. But I just really did think about my own personal life. What did I do? How did I go free? I want to see you go free. And when I thought about this, these are steps. Yes, they're baby steps. Not big steps, baby steps. Everybody can do these because everybody needs to be able to do these. They need to be simple. I didn't say they were easy, but they need to be simple. And they're really not just steps. They're mindsets that you've got to have. A way of thinking you've got to embrace. And there are things you've got to do if you're going to go free. Jesus actually talked about some of those things in John chapter 8. And we'll talk about it here in just a moment. I said this week before last whenever I was here. The first one really is the first one. And it's that you've got to admit that you're still in bondage. That is actually the first step to going free. Admitting I'm in bondage to this, I'm in bondage to that, whatever the case. You know, do I want to get up here and tell you I had a temper, I had a horrible anger problem, I was controlling, I had a horrible spirit, you know, problem with lust, I, you know, again, just addictions. Do I want to, no, I don't want to tell you that, but I found out there's freedom in admitting that I have this issue. I can't stop there, but that I got to start there, I got to acknowledge I got a problem. And Jesus in John chapter 8, talking to Jews who had believed on him, be like you and I, believing on him, following him. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. They probably didn't have any problem with that. And then he says, you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. They had a problem with that. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants, sir, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? And these guys, it's, it's, it's laughable. They're saying this while they're in bondage to Rome. And uh, so they're so proud, so religious, I guess, in their thinking, I don't know, that they're actually offended by the fact that Jesus would insinuate that they needed to be set free. Come on. And I gave you the example of, as me as a pastor, I've told people, because I have a, you know, I had had an anger problem, re- easy for me to recognize one, Couples will come in and they'll talk to me and we'll say, you know, we got problems in our marriage. Lots of times, very often, uh, somebody will have an anger problem. That's, that's a very uh, common problem in uh, many people's lives and in many people's homes. And I've looked at them and I've just said, sir or ma'am, could be a lady, but more often than not, it's the guy because, you know, he's the man, he's macho. And I say, sir, you have an anger problem. 
And I try to relate. I try to say, hey, listen, I, 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 just so you know, I struggle with this before I tell you this, but I, you, you've got an anger problem. And men get angry at me because I told him he had an anger problem. <laughs> I do not have an anger problem. I'm thinking, okay. <laughs> How many know you saying, I don't have an anger problem if you have an anger problem? Is as ridiculous as me saying, um, did you have a chocolate bar before you came in uh, today? Obviously you did because you have chocolate. How many of you had chocolate right here when you were walking? How many of you would want me to tell you? How many of you would want a friend to say, you have chocolate? What if you had a bougar? What if you had a hitchhiker? Let's say it that way. How many of you would want a friend to say, hey, you've got a hitchhiker? On the side? Come on, right? Is, are they being mean? Are they insulting you? Or are they trying to, you know, come on. No, they're just trying to help you. You don't want to, you don't want to go into the, around everybody having chocolate on your face like a two-year-old or a hitchhiker on your nose like, a, like the rest of us, you know. <laughs> you don't, right? Come on. You just want to own it. Oh, really? Yeah, you have an anger problem. Oh, you know what? I know, you're right. You need to address that. When you do, you're probably going to be amazed at not only how it turns around your relationship with your wife, but probably how it affects so much more of your life because it really will. Amen? And here's what Jesus said just to get it across to him in verse 34. I didn't talk about this. Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. That phrase there, because we read it and we think that it just means because I sin, I'm a slave to sin. It's really not, you know, exactly what that means. When it says whoever commits sin, it's talking about practicing sin. It's talking about a sin that is common to you in your life. It's something that you fall to frequently in your life. Getting angry was something that could be triggered pretty easy, pretty quickly in my life. Being controlling was something that I fell to very easily. All I had to do is just have circumstances that looked like they weren't going the way I wanted to. Are you all hearing me? He said, listen, if you, if you find yourself consistently falling to the same thing, this is not just you sinning occasionally. This is, you've got an issue. You've got a bondage in your life. And listen, and he says, you're a slave to that. And you know good and well you are because, again, who rules in that setting? How many know the sin does? That makes you a slave to that sin. So the first thing is admit it. Everybody say, admit it. Admit. Number two, you've got to acknowledge, this is a new one, you've got to acknowledge the pain and failure that your issue is causing you and others. One of the greatest motivations I had for finding freedom from all my stuff was the pain that I was causing myself, yes, but also others. My wife, for sure, my kids, definitely, sometimes other people in the church, and the way those issues were constantly undermining my success. I got tired of that. I got tired of, the, of my issues messing up my life. If you're going to go free you got to get tired of your stuff causing you so many problems, hurting you and hurting other people around you. They're certainly ready for you to deal with it. My wife was definitely waiting on me. First Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. This is called the prayer of Jabez. It's the only place Jabez is even talked about in the Bible. And it says that he's more honorable than his brothers. But his mom called him Jabez, which means sorrow, pain. How would you like to go through life being called sorrowful and being called pain all the time? Yeah. You know, I, sometimes that's what we're called, whether that was our name or not. You're just a pain. You're just always causing me trouble, whatever. And so that's how his life goes. And so one day he gets sick of it. It says in uh, 1 Chronicles 4.10, Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. We like talking about that. Enlarge my territory. We like talking about that. That your hand would be with me. Oh, yeah, we want his hand on us. 
that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. Most other, lots of other translations say so that I will not experience pain. Those translations are fine. I like this one better because it takes the focus on just me and the problems I'm causing myself and acknowledges the fact that when I don't deal with my issues, I'm causing somebody else pain too. If you've got anger, you're hurting somebody else. I will promise you that. If you're controlling, you're hurting somebody else. If you've got an addiction, you're hurting somebody else. You ever heard somebody say this? They'll say, you know, my issue isn't uh, causing anybody any problems but me. It isn't hurting anybody. That's how, this is how they say it. It isn't hurting anybody but me. Really? That's just another lie you believe. Sounds good. Makes you feel like, you know, you can excuse it. But ask anybody in your world, is your issue hurting them too? Bet they say, it sure do. I'm a poet today. Amen? You know, it gets quiet when I teach on things like this. You know why? Because husbands and spouses, husbands and wives, spouses have stuff going on in their home. And they need things like this taught on. They want things taught, uh, like this taught on. Makes them a little uncomfortable, though, because they're praying the person beside them acknowledges that, and they're feeling like they probably are feeling like, yeah, amen. Hope you're not one of those spouses that looks at your neighbor or looks at your spouse and tells them, well, he's talking to you, too. <laughs> yeah, I just didn't do that. He says, well, you're just so awesome. I don't tell you that to tell you I'm so awesome. I just realized it didn't do me any good to say he's talking to you too. You know what? My responsibility is not to change you. It's not to change my wife. It's not to change my kids. God, if I could change all them folks, I would change them. I would change them in a minute. I would change you. Absolutely. I would change you all to where you didn't cause me any problems. Not that you're a big problem, but I would just, that's, come on, I'd change you. Amen. I've just discovered I can't change you. God seems to struggle a little bit with changing you. Why would I ever think I could? We're always trying to change the other person. Change the person in the mirror. Change you, dude. Change you, lady. You're a full-time job. You ain't got no time to change nobody else. Well, what about them? Leave them to God. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. In your spare time, if you find some spare time, help somebody else change. Good luck. It's called, you know, futility. But anyway, I always thought about this. I thought about this one too. Hurting people hurt people, right? Right? Hurting, you get around hurting people, hurting people, hurt people. You know what I say to hurting people? And I love you hurting people. I've been a hurting people. Hurting people, get delivered from your hurts so you stop hurting people. Amen. Stop saying, well, I just had, I just gone. You don't know. You don't understand. <sighs> Maybe you're right. But we've all been through stuff. And you can either deal with your stuff, overcome your stuff, or you can just let stuff, your stuff, rule in your life. And I will promise you, you're still going to go to heaven. You're just not going to have much fun in this life. And you're going to take the fun out of life for a whole lot of people around you too. Amen? This is good preaching. Marta, remember the bet is on. (laughs) Number three. I must earnestly, listen, I didn't say how long this service was going to (laughs) go. I just said I'd get done. (laughs) I must earnestly desire to be free from whatever I'm in bondage to. I must earnestly desire. If you went up to most folks and said, hey, would you like to be set free? Yeah, 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 I really would. But they're not earnest about it. I'd like to be, but they're not going to do what they need to do to get free. (laughs) John chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, there's a man uh, 
he's at the pool of Bethesda. You know the, song, the, the story. He's been there uh, for a long time, the Bible says. He's been an invalid for 38 years. The story is, if you're there when the waters are troubled and the first one gets into that pool, is healed. They're delivered. They're set free. Let's say it that way because it's what we're talking about. So he's been there a long time. He keeps trying, and he keeps, he, he's, he's not the first one down there, and he stays, you know, in, an invalid. It'd be like many of us who've just, we've tried so many times. You know, I tried to overcome my temper on my own, and, you know, I'd give it a shot every once in a while. Come on, whatever. But I just kept failing. And so Jesus comes by. How many know when Jesus comes by in your life? And see, I think Jesus is coming by in your life through this series. I think Jesus is here right now. I think Jesus is coming by you. He's coming right, right now today to help you deal with your issue. Yeah, he's here. If two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. How many people are here right now? Is there more than two or three? He's here. That's a settled thing. There am I in the midst of them. What's he here in the midst of us to do? He's here to do what I'm talking about. He's here to set you free. Amen? So Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time. I know you've been going through this for a long time. I know you've struggled with this for a long time. I've seen you struggle and fail. And he says, do you want to be healed? What? Do you want to be healed? I love the Amplified Bible. That's really where I got the, the point. He says, are you really earnest in earnest about getting well? Are you really in earnest? You know me, words. I looked up the word earnest. It means serious in intention. He struggled and failed so many times he'd like to be set free, but I'll promise you he's no longer putting the same effort forth to make his way down there to that pool because he's just really given up and resigned himself. It's never going to happen. This is just going to be my lot in life. <laughs> Jesus says, if you want to go free, you're going to have to be in earnest about this. You're going to have to be willing to do whatever it takes. Now listen to what the man says. Sick man answered, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up and while I'm going another steps down before me. So he's got an excuse. He's got a reason. Listen to me. He's got a reason for why he is the way he is, why he's remained the way he's always been. And Jesus totally ignores the guy's excuse. What does Jesus do when you give him the reason for why you still are the way you are? He ignores what you're saying. Well, doesn't he care? Yeah, he cares so much that he ignores what you're saying because it's irrelevant. <laughs> He's there. He's ready to set you free. Doesn't make any difference how many times you've tried and failed in the past. Come on, he's present. He's ready to go work in your life. And so Jesus said to him, get up. Everybody say, get up. Yeah. So here's some effort. Get up out of your anger. Get up out of your lust. Get up out of your pornography. Get up out of whatever. Get up, get up. You can't get out of it if you don't get up. If you're just gonna sit there, lay in it, wallow in it, it's just gonna be the rest of your life. Get up, take up your bed, which means I'm not going to stay here anymore. I'm not going to be sleeping here anymore. I'm not going to be visiting here anymore. Take, I'm, going, I'm moving to a new place. I'm taking my bed. I'm going somewhere else. I'm going to live. Listen, when you take your bed somewhere else, you're living somewhere else. I've been living like this for 38 years. I'm moving and I'm going to be living in a new place. And it's a place called freedom. Amen. Take up your bed. Walk, do what you can't do. Do what you can't do. Control your temper. Stop being controlling. Come on. Deal with your stuff. Do what you say you can't do. I told you this, both times I looked at my wife with my temper. I said, I'm done. I will, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do it again. But when, when it came to being controlling, I looked at her and Brock in that car that night, and I said, I promise you, I give you my word, I will never try to control you another day of your life. Smith says, 
Were you successful? You'd have to ask them. But as far as I remember, as far as I know, I never tried to control them again. But I had to stop, grab myself with my temper, being controlling, whatever. Had to stop. What if you stopped and what if and where you get, get onto the computer and watch pornography? What if you just stopped yourself this time? What if you just stopped? Oh, I just have the. What if you just didn't go around those friends where you do those drugs? What if you just stopped? Oh, well, I got to have it. That's another point I'm going to make here real quickly in a moment. But what if you just said, I'm done. I'm not going back here. I'm not doing it. You got to do your part. Jesus just removed the taste from my mouth. Well, he didn't for me. I just didn't want another cigarette. I did. Anyway, is this okay? You can't make excuses for why you are the way you are and go free. (laughs) Amen? Number four, I must believe that Jesus can and will set me free. I must believe that Jesus can. He can. We all believe that. But I also must believe that he will. The example I want to give you is Mark chapter 9, the man who brings his son to Jesus who's possessed by an evil spirit that won't let him talk. The spirit seizes him, throws him violently to the ground. He foams at the mouth, grinds his teeth, and he becomes rigid. Now, how many of you would agree with me? This guy's got bigger problems than most of us. That's why I read that to you. (laughs) This guy's got some stuff going on. He brings his boy to the, the, the disciples, and they couldn't cast him out. I brought him to church. It just, you know, it didn't happen. So Jesus says, bring him to me. I'm the church, somebody in the church may not have been able to help you, but Jesus can. And it says, it says that Jesus said, how long has this been happening? There's really a message in that, but we'll talk about it later. Jesus asked the boy's father. He replied, since he was a little boy, the spirit often throws him into the fire, into the water, trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us if you can. Everybody say, if you can. Jesus goes, I love this. Jesus goes, what? What do you mean, if I can? You're talking to God. Come on. Jesus said, the problem's not if I can. The problem is on your end. If you can believe anything is possible to him, what, what, but what has to happen? I have to believe. I have to believe God can, God will, and I, I can go free from this. Amen? If you can believe. Everybody say, you got to believe. Freedom comes when you believe Jesus can set you free. Number five, John talked a lot about this, so I'm not going to talk about it a whole lot. And I don't like the way I've got this worded. I just couldn't think of a better way to word it. But it's number five is I must receive God's word as truth, make God's word final authority in my life, and then live by it. And I get that, John 8, 31, where Jesus said uh, to the Jews who believed on him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Everybody say, the truth will set you free. But see, you got to know the truth. Every bondage in your life, and I'm going to come back and teach on this somewhere down the road. Every bondage in your life is from you believing a lie. Eve in the Garden of Eden, the enemy says, hasn't God said you can eat of all the fruit in the of the trees in the garden? She says, yes, all but that one. And he said, if you eat that, eat from that, you'll you'll die. He says, you'll not surely, watch, you'll not surely die. He knows that if you eat that, you're gonna be like him, knowing good and evil. How many know they were already like him? She believed a lie, come on, about something God told her not to do. She thought it would bring her happiness. She thought it would bring her something greater in life. She believed a lie. And how many know when she believed that lie and embraced it as truth, she actually fell into bondage. You hear a lot right now about, well, your truth is not my truth. And your truth is not my truth. Really? Well, the problem is, if you've got all these truths out there, which truth? (laughs) Pilate asked that. What is truth? How many know there's only one truth? And it's the truth that you find in God's word. And as you continue in God's word, see your mind, our thinking and my microphone are messed up. 
How many know our thinking's off? Everything you believe about yourself is not right. It's why you ha- struggle with insecurity. It's why you struggle with anything you struggle with. Because be- you think if you do that, it's going to bring you happiness. Then you do it, and it doesn't bring you happiness. It brings you bondage. Right? So it's a lie, but now you're stuck. And so if you continue in, in his word, you become a student of the word. That's what a disciple is. And as you continue in his word, you start discovering the truth about who you are, how God sees you, about the way you should live your life, the things, the truths that you should embrace. You start living by those things. You know the truth now, and the truth sets you free. Amen? So if you think you're going to go free and stay free and never read your Bible, never renew your mind, never change the way you think, forget it. You've got to take responsibility for the way you think, the lies you believe, find out what they are, and then decide to live by God's word. Romans 12, 2 says, be not conformed to this world, be transformed, totally changed by the renewing, not by salvation, they're already saved, by the renewing of your mind, by, the, by you changing the way you think. When I change the way I think, it transforms my life. When I change the way I think, it sets me free from all of the lies that I have believed. I know I can do this. I'm the little train that could right now. I... <laughs> but I got to give you this example. Seven to ten ton elephant in a circus. Chain around its ankle, one of its ankles. Stuck to a stake in the ground. And the elephant believes that when he reaches the end of that chain, that that's as far as he can go. He's seven to ten tons. He can jerk that chain and stake up out of that ground so simply. But the problem is they put that chain on his leg a long time ago when he was just a little elephant and it could stop him. And that got into his psyche didn't get into his ability, he got into his psyche so much that now when he hits it, I can't go any further. That's as far as I can go. How many know if that elephant ever discovers the truth? Look out, everybody. <laughs> Amen? You believe a lie about yourself, about your situation, about your bondage. It is so strong in your life. You just say, I can't. This is me. This is the way I'll always be. You ever discover the truth, it will literally be like that elephant. I was going to bring a big old log chain in here today. And I thought, well, I won't have time for that. And I was just going to wear it and then get you to realize I don't need great power to break this log chain because I'd never be able to do that. I'm not Samson. All I need to do is, when I know the truth, the chain just slips off and falls. (laughs) Number six, number six, number six, I've got to live my life submitted to the Lordship of Christ. I can't live my life doing whatever I want, any way I want, and think I'm going to be free and stay free i got to live my life submitted to the Lord. Again, it goes back to what John says. God's framed our life with his word, the Ten Commandments, his principles, his precepts. They're not to place limitations on our life that keep us from life. They're to place boundaries on our life that keep us from getting into things that will rob us of our life and bring us bondage in our life. They're not to our detriment. They're for our good. So I get in there and I discover what God's framework is. I discover what he tells me to do and I make him Lord of my life and I actually do it because in Luke Luke 6, 46, he says, why? Boy, the church is full of these. Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I tell you to do? If Jesus is really Lord of your life, you'll do what he tells you to do. Number seven, I got to take responsibility for my life. In 
Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. It says, For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. i got to take responsibility. I thought about how uh, whenever I left home at the ripe old age of 16, I wanted to be free from my mom and dad's rules. Do what I want to do. Live how I wanted to live. So I left home. Honor student. Doing great in school. All kinds of stuff. But I knew better. So I left home. You know what I found out the first week? I better work. Because now I got to buy gas for my car. I got to pay insurance on my car. I got to pay rent. And I got to buy food. And I found out that life came with a lot of responsibilities. And the moment I said, I'm going to party today. How many know I'm setting myself up to either not be able to pay my rent or, you know, not buy food or not buy my drugs, whichever one, you know, I don't know, whichever one came at the time. I'd buy drugs before I'd do any of the other. And, if you, and you know exactly what I mean if, you're, if you, that's where you're at. You can't live an irresponsible life and be free and stay free. You got to accept responsibility for where you are in your life right now, accept responsibility for going free, and then accept responsibility for going, uh, staying free. Number eight, I've got to walk in my authority. I've got to walk in my authority, the authority that I have in Christ. How many of you will give me four more minutes? How many of you will give, give them to me if I, if I ask you for them? How many of you give me, how many of you'd give me 25 more minutes if I, no, I'm just kidding. So here's why this one's so important. I, od- I overdosed on uh, acid and mescaline mixed together. And, man, I'm dying. And it's way too long for me to tell you the story, but God delivers me in that in, a, in just a matter of a couple hours. Great testimony I'll tell some other time. But the, the problem is it weakens me psychologically horribly. I struggled after that, feeling like I was kind of losing it sometimes. My wife and I get married, and we start this church, and uh, I'm all of 23, and my wife has already told me I don't know what I'm doing, (laughs) and it becomes very apparent on the front end, I really don't, and there are people in this community that are saying horrible things about us, and I'm just, you know, because Jim Jones had pulled his deal with the Kool-Aid and all that, it was just a bad deal. Christians were actually giving me the hardest time of, of all. And I started struggling with anxiety so bad that I would go to bed while it was still daylight out. My wife should have known immediately there was a problem then. I could hear the kids playing in the living room. They're, little, they're three, four years old, maybe something like that, two, three. And uh, I can hear her in the kitchen, you know, the dishes banging against the sink. I hear things that keep my, my mind kind of focused long enough for me to fall asleep. And if I couldn't fall asleep, and the moment it started getting dark, man, my mind would just start racing with me. And I literally would think, I, I thought I was losing my mind. And it's, I would not wish that on my worst enemy. And one night, I'm laying there, and it starts racing. And I hear God say just as clearly as, you know, I've ever heard him speak to me. He says, he doesn't say, son, I'm going to give you deliverance over this right now. That's not what I hear. I hear him say this, how long are you going to put up with this well see when he says that to me I know what he means because I've been studying the word long enough that I know that in Christ I have authority come on and he gives me authority over all the power of the enemy so nothing he does shall by any means harm me and this is harming me whatever I bind on earth will be bound whatever I loose on earth will be loosed it's not what he does what he binds he'll back me but I got to take the initiative I got to bind it I got to loose it I got to use my authority because he's given it to me So when he says, how long are you going to put up with this? I literally say this out loud, no longer. I sit up in bed. I take authority over the devil. Satan, I take authority over you in the name of Jesus. I am not going to put up with this any longer. I am not going to struggle with my thoughts. I'm not going to lose another night's sleep. The Bible says you give your beloved rest, Father. I'm going to lay my head down on here, and I'm going to sleep. So I lay my head down on that pillow, and I wish I could tell you that instantaneously... I had no more racing thoughts. 
but I, my head was racing every bit as fast as it was before I took authority because you got to walk it out. you got to take authority. you got to walk. You can't just take authority. you got to walk in your authority. And I thought about it, and I thought about, you know what? Sleeping, people snore. I didn't at the time. Do now, but I didn't then. And so I just, I just did this. I went... <clears throat> Excuse me. <laughs> Fell asleep. Now, I've never struggled with that ever happening in my life again. You got to walk. You can't put up with the devil. You can't put up with stuff. You got to exercise your authority. Number nine, you got you to deal with your issues aggressively and decisively. It's like me saying, telling my wife, I'm not going to do it again. Jesus said this, if your eye, even your good eye causes you to lust, gouge it out. How many know that's pretty decisive and pretty aggressive? <laughs> if your right hand offend, you know, is causing you to sin, cut it off. That's pretty aggressive. That's pretty decisive, right? I love Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 out of the Amplified. It says, so kill, deaden, deprive of power the evil, I love this, the evil desire lurking in your members. How many know you got some stuff lurking in you? You got some stuff lurking in your flesh. Are you all still with me? Yes. I'm almost done. I'm not going to come back next Sunday and finish this. We're here. We're finishing it now. John can say, Dad, you went way too long. And I'll say, up your nose with a rubber hose. <laughs> yeah. You know what? We don't, we don't, we don't crucify our flesh. We, 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 you know, and we're going to try and we're, we're going to do our best. And, you know, with Jesus' help, we're not going to do it. You're going to do it again. You're going to do it again, you weak. Me. Come on. You're not dealing with it aggressively enough. Hey, how many of you women hate snakes? A, snake's come, a snake comes through the front door. Nobody's there. What are you going to do? Call Ghostbusters. What are you going to do? You call your husband. How many know you're going to get aggressive with getting that snake out of your house? Because you don't want snakes in your house. Listen, if you're going to stop doing whatever it is you struggle with, you got to deal with it aggressively and decisively. Here's what that says. Kill, deaden, deprive of power, the evil desire lurking in your members. Uh, those animal impulses and all that is earthly in you that is employed in sin. Jesus also said the ax is laid to the root. I never one time asked my wife if I was getting better. Am I doing better? Am I doing better? Do you know why I never ask? I, I, when people tell me that, I know they're not going to make it. Because see, if I tell you you're doing better, what you're going to think is, okay, I'm doing better, and you're going to let off. Listen, you've got to put your pedal... You got to put the pedal to the metal when it comes to going free. You got to put the pedal to the metal, and you got to keep it there until you are free. Yeah. Better is the is the enemy of totally free. Am I at number 10? Am, hey, you better be ready to cough up that dollar. <laughs> I got to be determined. I got to be determined to go free and stay free. And that's why the apostle Paul said, Christ has freed us so that we may enjoy the benefits of freedom. Therefore, everybody say, therefore, be firm in this freedom. Come on, be established in the freedom that is yours and don't become slaves again. Because if you don't think the enemy is not sneaking around trying to lure you back, right back into whatever it was you did, which is where your weakness was, maybe still is to some degree, or into something new, you are fooling yourself. You gotta be sober and vigilant. How many, how many, how many learned anything out of this? How many got something out of this? Yeah.